Welcome everyone who's just joining us. We've got a great crowd today. We're gonna, I'm seeing lots of folks sign on. So we will um, wait until everyone logs in and we will get started in just a moment. For those of you that are just joining, this session will be recorded and closed, closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcription button in the menu bar. Thanks, Natalie, for your note. We're glad to have you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us. We're so glad to have you. We'll get started in just a moment. All right, I'm looking at the clock. It's just about time to start, although I'm seeing people join as we speak. So we will welcome them as they come. Um, but let's get started with a couple introductions. First of all, welcome to everyone who's here today to this month's Let's See You Well presentation. I am pleased to be able to introduce our um, featured presenter, Dr. Clint Carroll. I am also pleased to welcome members of our CU Boulder community here today, so including alumni, students, employees, members of the larger CU system, and even members of the local and national community who are here today. I'm Erin Cunningham Ritter. I'm representing the CU Boulder Be Well program, and I'm pleased to announce that this presentation is a collaboration with the Arts and Sciences JEDI team. I'd like to first introduce my partner, uh, Marisha Lopez, to share a bit more about the work from the ANS JEDI team and for the CU land acknowledgement. Marisha, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so glad that you all could be here today and join us. Um, so I am the program manager for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and we develop programs and initiatives aimed at creating a more welcoming and inclusive environment for our students, staff, and faculty. Um, we actually have a really interesting workshop coming up this Wednesday that I will drop the link for in the chat in case any of you are interested in attending that. Um, it does uh, require registration beforehand. And now I will um, just go ahead and start our land acknowledgement. We invite you to take a moment to reflect on our relationship to this land of Boulder and relationship to local indigenous communities as we are guided by the university's land acknowledgement. The University of Colorado Boulder honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state and in stewardship to land before the establishment of the state into this present moment. CU Boulder humbly acknowledges that it is located on the traditional and current homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other native nations and communities. The violent forced removal of native people from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. These histories have brought us to the present moment wherein the University of Colorado Boulder is determined to commit to improving and enhancing relationships with indigenous communities and issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, faculty, and their work, educating, conducting research, supporting student success and integrating indigenous knowledge, and consulting, engaging, and working collabor collaboratively with Native communities to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. Thank you, Marisha. Um, now I'd like to thank you all for joining this month's Let's See You Well presentation. 
The Let's See You Well speaker series allows arts and sciences researchers and practitioners to interpret the eight dimensions of wellness from their perspective, thus articulating the value of a liberal arts education through the lens of wellness and overall health, while supporting a culture of care at CU Boulder and beyond. Before we begin, I'd like to note that this workshop is being recorded and closed captioning is available by clicking on the CC button to view the live transcription. And we'll have time for questions and answers and discussion at the end of this presentation. Today, we are proud to host our February Let's See You Well expert, Dr. Clint Carroll for his presentation titled Indigenous Health, Healing and Climate Change, Insights from the Cherokee Nation. Clint Carroll is an Associate Professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies in the Department of Ethnic Studies. A citizen of the Cherokee Nation, his longstanding work with the Cherokee community in Oklahoma aims to advance methods and strategies for Indigenous land education and community-based conservation. He writes and thinks at the intersection of critical Indigenous studies, anthropology, and political ecology. Dr. Carroll currently co-edits the Cambridge University Press series, Elements in Indigenous Environmental Research. He also serves on the editorial boards for cultural anthropology and environment and society. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Clint Carroll for our February Let's See You Well presentation. Clint, take it away. Thank you, Erin and Marisha. Uh, wonderful to see you all here today. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces and names. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to transition to sharing my screen, so bear with me for just a moment. All right, I'm getting a thumbs up from Aaron. Thank you very much. Osio nigata wo u kahate si kwa ni o hada wado ale gali e li ga ji de do ako hi ga. I said um, hello everyone. Uh, I gave you my Cherokee name, and I'm just uh, happy. I said I'm happy to be here. I'm happy we're all here today. Um, I wanted to start off with, on that note, with uh, reflecting on the theme of health and healing in the Cherokee language. And so as um, uh, Aaron said, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I'll say a little bit more uh, about uh, my current work and how I situate myself within the, the, the broad theme of health. Um, but I wanted to uh, look at some Cherokee words with you all and uh, highlight some of the intrinsic ways of expressing health and well-being in Cherokee. And so, this here is the Cherokee syllabary. It, uh, it looks sometimes like the English alphabet or the English orthography, uh, but it actually sounds completely different. Uh, so this here says chalagi, which is a, a way for expressing in our language Cherokee. Um, but if you were to say, uh, I guess commonly uh, translated to English, how are you? You would say, oh, see, would you? And what that really means is, are you still well? So if you look at OC, this word OC, it's uh, that word standing alone means well. Guo means a continual action, and Ju is kind of like a question marker. So OC, would you? Are you still well? That's how we, uh, you know, ask people, how are you doing? And interestingly enough, the word for hello, OCO also has that in, in there. And so even just in our word, our greeting to each other, uh, we have this sense of wellness or kind of uh, a greeting of, of, of being in good health or, or um, acknowledging that you're well and that the other person you're greeting is well. Another way to express this, and I'll get into this word specifically uh, later, uh, is tohija. So tohi is the word that we could translate or gloss as peace, balance, also broadly wellness. Um, Tohija, are you at peace? And just to highlight this as well, in another word, nawa tohiti is our 
word for general well-being, and you can see tohi in there. Um, and so wellness, peacefulness, balance, these are themes in the Cherokee language and in Cherokee culture uh, that speak to how we understand health. So a little bit more about me. Um, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, but I grew up in Dallas, Texas. So I grew up away from the community. Um, I'm trained in cultural and applied anthropology, critical indigenous studies, uh, and political ecology. And my scholarly and scientific goals are tied to uh, my community in Oklahoma, the Cherokee Nation. Um, when I was just embarking on graduate school, I had the privilege of working with the Environmental Services Office, and then what later became the Natural Resources Office as an intern, as an um, environmental technician um, over the course of three summers. And that really formed the foundation of, of my work today. And so through that, it's, it's been for me a story of reconnecting um, with uh, extended relatives, uh, with land, language, culture. Um, and I've been really honored to, to work on how Cherokee people understand uh, the plant world and how we know and relate to plants in Oklahoma in what is now called Oklahoma, um, as well as how Cherokee people are navigating uh, what are quite fractionated landscapes. I'll go into this more in detail later, but we lost uh, about 98% of our land base as a result of the allotment policy. So my current work is exploring uh, how Cherokee people are navigating um, uh, a land base that is parceled out uh, in terms of private property, but also how climate change is affecting those limited parcels of land on which to carry out our land-based knowledge and practices like plant medicine and uh, food ways and other things. So wrapped up in that work is, uh, you know, how do we as a nation, uh, the Cherokee Nation that is, um, strategically conserve our tribal lands that we've managed to hang on to, as well as reacquire and gain access to other lands that would enable our people to continue those relationships to the land. Uh, and then uh, also working with younger people, working with tribal youth uh, in, in collaboration with uh, a group of elders who call themselves the Cherokee Nation Medicine Keepers. Um, and we are currently conducting a land-based education program. Um, uh, and that's been going on over the course of the past four and a half years. And so it's important to me, as I situate myself within this theme of health and, and well-being, excuse me, I need to move everyone's faces here, sorry, <laughs> to see my notes. Um, many indigenous understandings of health do not separate landscape health from community and individual health. Uh, so for Cherokee people today, we have to contend with a number of uh, things that have led up to where we are today, including forced removal from our homelands, as well as the ongoing threats to our environment that have all resulted in negative impacts to our health. And so I'd like to uh, open up, or at least continue this opening uh, with a story, uh, a Cherokee story. And in the field of indigenous studies, we take seriously the knowledge and ethical frameworks contained in the stories of our peoples. And so in this spirit, I want to recount a Cherokee story that um, tells of a formative time when we came to understand our relationship to the other than human or more than human world. So I've chosen some artwork here by Cherokee Nation citizen, um, America Meredith, and she's a, an amazing artist. Um, and in her series that she calls Medicinal Formula, she visualizes through her artwork the titles of various incantations, or as we call them, the full substance of which can be used to assist people and conversely to harm others, although this is generally shunned in the practice of traditional medicine. Uh, but these images aren't meant to convey uh, or aren't, aren't meant to uh, illustrate this story. I just chosen them because I, I feel like they are a, a really beautiful way of, of thinking about the story from the, the artwork of a Cherokee artist. 
So many indigenous oral traditions center the agency and personhood of animals and plants. This is true for Cherokees, and many of our stories teach us about both human and animal personalities in this way. And this isn't to be reduced to um, a colonial um, uh, work that uh, was really one of exploitation um, by some of you may uh, be familiar with Rudyard Kipling and uh, his presentation of quote unquote, just so stories uh, that were extracted from indigenous communities and presented out of context uh, for the amusement of outsiders. Um, rather when presented in culturally and place specific context, uh, our stories are powerful teaching tools. So there are numerous stories for how Cherokee people came to know and use plants for medicine, but this one is especially illuminating and it's widely known and, and it's also uh, publicly available. So the story goes that long ago, the animals decided to take revenge on the human beings who had been killing them indiscriminately and without the proper acknowledgement of gratitude for their gifts of life. The animals gathered in a ground, excuse me, in a grand council meeting to decide how they could retaliate in response to this egregious show of disrespect. Many representatives of the animal nations offered proposals, including direct warfare, but the animals decided that the most effective way to bring the people back into balance was through the creation of disease. So for example, the spirit of little deer, Ahwi Usti, is said to cause rheumatism in hunters who take a deer without giving thanks, so they can never pull back a bowstring again. Ultimately, despite the poor behavior of the human beings, the plants took pity on them and offered themselves as the many medicines Cherokees know today. So this story teaches not only the obligation of Cherokee people to respect our animal relatives, both by learning from past mistakes, as this story tells, and in understanding the power that animals can wield against them if they're disrespected but also that we owe a debt of gratitude to the plants for coming to the people's aid when they needed them most. In other words, it describes Cherokee people's relationship to the other than human world. It orients us and grounds us in relational obligations of respect, reciprocity, and care. So I've been privileged to learn more about these concepts as they are expressed in Cherokee culture and language through my relationship and partnership with the Cherokee Medicine Keepers. The Medicine Keepers are a small group of elders and knowledge keepers whose mission is to protect Cherokee lands and help perpetuate Cherokee land-based knowledge for future generations. The group arose through the cultural projects I worked on with Cherokee Nation staff, uh, and that's been since 2004. Um, Cherokee Nation staff, uh, specifically within the Secretary of Natural Resources Office, um, uh, all of us have helped facilitate the medicine, the, the medicine keepers meetings and activities since their formation in 2008. So we've been working together uh, with the medicine keepers uh, for almost two decades. And this is a, an image of some of the group who were able to be there for the banquet at the Cherokee National Holiday in 2017. And this is uh, them with some dignitaries, some Cherokee Nation dignitaries, uh, accepting a community leadership award um, during that time. It's a very proud moment for all of us. So I wanted to point out uh, this individual here, this man here, his name is Croslin Smith. Um, he is uh, currently 93 years old. He's a practicing medicine person. Uh, he is, he has, he carries the title of spiritual leader of the Cherokee Nation. And uh, I've just had the wonderful privilege to get to know him through this work. Uh, and uh, we've grown very close and we've worked together, um, most notably, uh, well, through the medicine keepers uh, for whom he serves as an advisor, uh, but also through the publication of two books that I've, um, that he asked me to, to help him with. And so I wanted to um, talk about 
Cherokee approaches to health and healing through the lens of his books that I've, again, been privileged to, to work with him on, but that have really made me so much more familiar with the way that Cherokee people understand health and healing uh, in the process of editing and compiling and uh, numerous uh, uh, phone calls and visits to him uh, regarding the content. And so just as a preface, these books, and you'll see the images here with the, the titles, you can, uh, you can find them on Amazon, believe it or not. Um, uh, we just got them available uh, just last year on that platform. Uh, so you can purchase them through, uh, through, that, uh, through that method as well as through contacting the press, which is called Dog Soldier Press out of um, Taos, New Mexico. Um, but this is his first book and it's titled Stand as One, Spiritual Teachings of Ketua, Awakening to the Original Truths. And uh, just as a footnote, uh, Ketua there, it's, it looks like Ketua, but it's pronounced Ketua. Uh, that's our original name uh, for ourselves that was actually given to us by the creator as Cherokee people. And so when you hear someone say Ketua or Gadu Wagi, that's our original name. So what Croslin is uh, presenting in this book, uh, a number of things, um, I highly recommend that you, you, you get a copy. Uh, but uh, regarding the, the topic of healing, um, Throughout his life and in his practice as a traditional medicine person, um, he emphasizes that healing can't be separated from spirituality. And this holds true, I would say, by and large for many, if not um, most indigenous peoples, according to their traditional medicine practices. But he talks about this in terms of the spirit and the spirit being a way to express the connection that we all have with each other the connection that we have with other than human beings, uh, the land itself, uh, the water, many plants and animals, and of course the connection that we have with uh, the creator. And in this work, he also emphasizes that healing is performed through relationship, um, that his clients, as he calls them, are never, um, he never attempts to heal someone without first getting to know them and consulting with them about uh, what's bothering them. Um, and then uh, thirdly, he says that healing starts with being in accord with oneself and the world around you. And that emphasizes that it's not just about um, understanding spirituality through um, uh, a removed way, uh, but understanding that we all have the power to to be spiritual, con spiritually connected within ourselves. And so he emphasizes the need to align um, your own spirit that the creator gave all of us at birth um, with um, that of your fellow human beings, uh, with that of any plants that you might uh, approach for medicine. Uh, and then of course, with, um, with the land itself. And this here is an image of the cover of his second book. Uh, it came out in 2021. It's titled Original Teachings Designed to Stand as One, Early Ketua Teachings and Traditions. And I wanna actually quote from this book directly uh, because here he writes about how traditional healers uh, from a Cherokee perspective uh, see medicine. And some of the quotes are highlighted in the slide. But he writes, Traditional healers view medicine as the act of healing someone's spirit that has been wounded. In many cases, a wounded spirit leads to other dysfunctions of the body. The cause of the original wound could be something foreign that enters the body and upsets the natural balance. This results in sickness. And although two individuals may exhibit similar symptoms, traditional healers know that the root cause of that sickness may actually be different. This is the main difference between Western medicine and what we call Indian medicine. Indian medicine is used to regain balance. When something is in disarray or out of esteem, someone who is elderly and wise about the use of medicine helps get the person back in harmony or balance. And so there's that 
those words again, harmony, balance, as I expressed uh, previously through the Cherokee word tohi. And he emphasizes that plants are helpers, but cannot perform their job without this spiritual component. And so again, as he illuminated in the quote that I just read, that's something that Western medicine has a hard time with, is understanding the spirituality of healing. Um, that is something that cannot be uh, separated uh, from that act within a lot of indigenous healing traditions. Another book that I would recommend is uh, by Lisa Leffler and Thomas Belt. Um, Thomas Belt, um, we know him as Tom Belt. Um, he is a, a fluent Cherokee speaking um, elder who actually is from Oklahoma originally, but resides in uh, North Carolina with the Eastern Band of Cherokees. And he wrote this book with his uh, co-author, Lisa Leffler, who um, is not Indian, but who resides in the Appalachian Mountains and, and has roots there. And so they, they partnered through this work uh, to think about, uh, as the subtitle reads, Cherokee Health and Well-Being in Southern Appala Appalachia. And so the book is Sounds of Tohi. So if you're interested in this word, um, th this is really an extended study on um, what this concept means to Cherokee people. And as I mentioned or, or alluded to previously, tohi reflects things moving in a natural or peaceful way. So think, think about peace, think about um, um, calm beingness. And to quote Tom Belt uh, directly, he writes, the clouds and grass moving at their own pace, not rushed or urgent. Uh, that encapsulates what we might think of as tohi. Harmony and well-being, balance and peace can reflect the essence of tohi. Illness, harmfulness, stress can pull one away from tohi, particularly if left to be dealt with uh, for any length of time. And so what I've hoped to illuminate so far is that for Cherokee healers specifically and for Cherokee people um, you know, broadly, medicine as we know it is, is a philosophy really of how to live right in the world. So a traditional healer's role is to allow their client to reattain lost balance in relationships. And this work is done through the spirit. So matching a client's spirit with healing elements that could include the use of medicinal plants. And so I, I, I put here this, these uh, four elements that we might consider uh, to be a framework for uh, how many indigenous peoples understand health. And this is in contrast to what we might know as the, the common trilogy of, of mind, body, spirit, um, or I wouldn't say contrast, it's in addition to that. So we have the emphasis on uh, physical health, mental health, spiritual health, and then to add a fourth component to that common trilogy, um, relational health. And I would emphasize here that when we think about relational health, it's not just between human beings, it's including other than human beings. So relationships with land as well. Um, and so this aligns with a lot of what we see in indigenous studies or um, in research done um, with and for indigenous communities that uh, the health of the people uh, is, is just as important or it's related to the health of the land itself. So transitioning to thinking about health disparities and some of the roots of them being in the act of colonialism itself. And so we, when we think about health and, and how indigenous peoples and indigenous communities experience a disproportionate um, negative health, health outcomes, we have to go back to um, the dawn of colonization. And so there were the estimated 90 to 120 million indigenous people in the Americas before 1492. Um, and after contact, we saw compound epidemics that swept through South and Central America between 1576 and 1591. 
um, you'll see a, a, a litany of, of foreign pathogens, foreign diseases that were introduced, um, but the most deadly being smallpox. And so by 1650, the indigenous population in the Americas was reduced by 90%. So this uh, was a significant, I'll put it uh, one way, significant um, impact upon our, our indigenous peoples in, in the Western hemisphere. So was this purely biological or is there more to the picture? Well, when we look at the uh, definition of health disparities from the CDC, they say that health disparities are inequitable and are directly related to the historical and current unequal distribution of social, political, economic, and environmental resources. And I would like to add to that, that colonialism as we know it, uh, creates the, condition, the conditions for health disparities, uh, as well as many other social and environmental ills. And so we, we look at histories of uh, forced removals, uh, warfare, confinement to reservations, assimilation policies, the allotment policy in the United States. And then lastly, unfulfilled treaty promises uh, that have resulted in limited healthcare resources and impeded access to care in many indigenous communities. And we understand then that it's not just a biological issue that these are very political things when we talk about health disparities among indigenous peoples um, uh, today. And so all of this has led to uh, lack of access to healthy food um, uh, and especially traditional foods and the food ways and, and life ways that go with them. Um, high rates of diabetes as a result, uh, disconnection from land and culture, among many other things. And so if this works, just to lighten the mood a little bit, for those of you who are watching or have watched Reservation Dogs, I just thought I'd throw this in there. <laughs> it's uh, from season one, episode two. If you're not familiar with this uh, show, I highly recommend it. Uh, but this is a, a scene in one of the uh, tribal clinics uh, that's featured in, in that series. I'm not gonna explain it. If you've seen it, you get it. If not, check it out. But we also have to think about climate change uh, as an impact uh, that more recently our peoples have had to contend with uh, as, um, as they um, uh, focus on improving and, and, and seeking um, a better health or health sovereignty as we might call it. So I wanna highlight a quote by Dr. Daniel Wildcat, who's a, a Yuchi uh, citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, and how he views climate change in this context of, of, of removals. And, um, and I wanna put this in specifically conversation with health. He writes, I get angry when I think about global warming. I get angry because I know the history of involuntary removals and relocations indigenous peoples throughout the United States and around the world have endured. So when I began hearing the reports of indigenous displacement as a result of climate change, I got angry. I thought, here we go again, another removal of indigenous peoples. So I wanna bring it back to uh, Cherokee history and contemporary experiences um, by just showing this map and what this represents are the, uh, the, well, the eastern extent of our homelands. And you can kind of make out the present day political boundaries of the Southeastern United States. So Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, right in here was our core settlement area. So within the Blue Ridge Mountains of the Southern Appalachians. Uh, so the Eastern Band still resides in Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, right around here, roughly. Uh, but where the majority of Cherokee people uh, are today in the Cherokee Nation, as well as the United Ketua Band, um, which is our, uh, the third federal, federally recognized Cherokee tribe, is here in what is currently known as Oklahoma, the northeastern corner of it. So what I want to highlight here is this removal, this, uh, well, historic removal that took place in late 1838, early 1839, uh, along what has become known as the Trail of Tears. 
has led to Cherokee people having to adapt to very different lands, uh, but nonetheless, lands that share some similarities with the homelands. And so you can see the Ozark Highlands ecoregion, as well as the Boston Mountains, the really the westernmost extent uh, here in, in the contemporary Cherokee Nation, um, does contain a lot of the familiar topographical as well as um, uh, biological uh, diversity that Cherokee people once knew in the homelands. But what's happening here, to go back to Dan Wildcat's quote, is uh, we think about not only the, the dramatic effects of climate change in the Arctic North, for example, or in uh, archipelagos uh, who are experiencing sea level rises um, and then um, you know, the, the melting of the permafrost in the Arctic regions causing land to, to literally fall into the ocean. Uh, but we're witnessing here in what we could call the Midwest, um, a, a shift of climate that Cherokee people in Oklahoma are experiencing with regard to the availability of our medicinal plants that we once or that we know that are somewhat in common with those in the homelands. And so even within uh, a landlocked locked area and um, in, a, in a place that not many people think of when they think of uh, climate change, um, Cherokee people are having to contend with the forces that are literally pulling plants and um, our access to them out from under our feet. And so here I wanted just to highlight that climate change and colonialism are, are really to me two sides of the same coin. And for indigenous peoples confronting this is fundamentally about restoring, reclaiming and protecting the relationships that we've managed to, to hang on to. Uh, despite assimilation and the policy known as allotment. And I wanted just to show you briefly an image of the Cherokee Nation Reservation. Uh, all of this area was once owned in full by the people. But as a result of that policy uh, that I keep mentioning, the allotment policy, uh, we lost about 98% of our lands. And what you see represented here in the, in the darker areas are the contemporary Cherokee Nation tribal trust lands. So even within the reservation boundary, um, we don't have full autonomy or sovereignty or control over our, our tribal lands. And so with that, I wanna just conclude by asking the question or you know, presenting uh, a question to you all, um, you know, what are we doing about it? Um, you know, rather than just lying down or rather than just uh, throwing our hands up, um, the Cherokee Nation, Cherokee communities, as well as most, if not all, indigenous communities are, are actively confronting these forces um, through different programs. And I wanted to highlight some of the work that I'm doing with the Medicine Keepers uh, to, uh, to show you what that looks like. And so part of my current work, and this uh, is an image of uh, Anna Six Killer and John Ross, who are members of the Cherokee Medicine Keepers Group. We're working with them to coordinate and conduct a land education program with Cherokee uh, youth and young people. And this is an image here of Anna teaching uh, the students how to make a traditional food that we call ganaji. Uh, from scratch. And it's, this is made out of hickory nuts, wild harvested hickory nuts. They're pounded here in this mortar, mortar and pestle that she's using. And these tools have been passed down for um, at least three or four generations in her family. And then here we have a traditional canon. It's a wooden stump that's been hollowed out uh, to create a basin here in the central center. And uh, once the, the meat from the nut is extracted, you put that in there and pound it using a giant pestle, a wooden pestle called a, a nostosti. And um, you form that into a, a ball and that creates, um, uh, well, the, the natural oils are released and they allow you to kind of mold it into a ball. And you can store that away and then cook it when you need to. But basically you submerge that in, in boiling water, let it simmer, strain it out add, uh, typically we add hominy to that. And it's a really delicious and healthy 
uh, food that we, we have in the fall and winter. So she's teaching the, the students here how to make kaneji. And if you wanna learn more about this project, I've included the URL for you here. Um, but we've, like I said, we've been doing this for the past four and a half years. Uh, COVID has definitely impacted the work that we've been able to do because of our inability to, to meet with the elders uh, under tribal restrictions, which um, have first and foremost to, uh, sought to protect our elders and our, our speakers, uh, our knowledge keepers. Uh, but we recently resumed this work as of last fall and um, actually graduated our first cohort. So all these um, students here that you see have, have graduated from the program, even though they'll, they'll still be involved uh, in the future, just uh, not necessarily in that form, formal capacity. This is another, another image that um, just highlights some of the work that we do. This is one of our medicine keepers, Gary Van, uh, showing uh, three of our students uh, a, the root of a plant. And this was one of the impromptu activities that we did because Summer here in the center had asked uh, Gary about this plant and recalled that he had talked about it previously and he um, you know, gave them permission to, to dig it up and take a look at it and she took it home and um, made some tea from it uh, and uh, you know this is what this work is all about is understanding um, not just the esoteric knowledge that uh, of what a plant could be used for but actually you know believing in it and using it and, and practicing it. And the other thing that goes hand in hand with this work that I mentioned uh, earlier is, is tribal land conservation. So this is a, an image uh, in spring of a tract of land that the elders have uh, named here in the syllabary, I'll say it out loud, and you'll notice here, tohi, if you can recognize those syllables, uh, also uh, is in that word, which means uh, peaceful. So the peaceful, Place of medicine, na wo ti e. So, na uh, wo is how we say medicine, and na wo ti e is uh, the place of medicine. And so, as of uh, last April, so a little under a year ago, this was designated as a preserve, restricted to use um, by uh, cultural uh, activities, uh, including the medicine keepers and the student cohort. Uh, and it's the first of its kind uh, for Cherokee people in the Cherokee Nation. And so we're really proud of that. And it's been a, a long time in the works, but uh, it was officially announced by our principal chief and the tribal council last April. So I have many other things that I could talk about, but I wanted to uh, end there and open up for any questions, uh, thoughts, and engagements um, from you all. Um, so thank you very much. Well, don't and uh, I'll turn it over to Aaron uh, to moderate. Well, thank you so much. And before we get, begin question and answers or any insights or thoughts our guests may have, let's just show a little appreciation for Dr. Carroll and his amazing insights and work. Um, I hope you can see there's lots of hands clapping and hearts and emojis coming your way. So um, we'll begin with gratitude for your amazing presentation. But we do have a few minutes if anyone has any questions, any insights, um, anything they'd like to bring up. And I'll be monitoring the chat for raised hands. You can come off of mute. Seeing lots of gratitude coming your way in the chat. Let's keep monitoring. Here's a um, raised hand. Go ahead, SN. We chatted earlier. There we go. Oh, I just wanted to congratulate my colleague. You know, as an indigenous person myself. Um, I was not surprised by the similarities between my people in Africa and uh, the Cherokee nations. Um, but what I was actually um, proud of, which I cannot do myself, is that my colleague was very composed while he was talking about really, really difficult and painful history of loss 
of, of neglect, of continuous, uh, continuous, continuing oppression and discrimination. So kudos to you because you, I mean, you were just talking as if you do, yay, <laughs> this is it. So when I grow up, I want to be like you, but thank you very much for that uh, presentation. And by the way, that way of, of, of making food, of carving a hole in the stump, we do exactly the same thing. You know, that's how we make our traditional or fufu or couscous, some people call it. So thank you very much. I really don't have a question just so that I, I enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Essen. It's great to see you here and I, I really appreciate you. Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's amazing the, the, the commonalities and, um, you know, that's something that, uh, like you said, it's never surprising, but it's always um, reaffirming and, and, and interesting to, to learn about how these things relate um, across the, the globe. So thank you for your comment. Just monitoring the chat, just so you know, I, I'm sure you can see it too. You've got lots of gratitude coming your way. Um, a specific comment, great talk, really nice to learn more about the Cherokee culture and spirituality. So much to absorb and contemplate. Thank you for the content. Um, excellent presentation. I'm seeing a new message pop in. Oh, it, it looks like a, um, a note coming from you from Jesus at the bottom. Thank you all. Yeah, I appreciate all the comments. And I would just say, um, you know, I probably left a lot out and, and to, to my colleague um, SN's point, you know, this is, um, I, I guess I, I wouldn't say that I'm used to it, but I've, I've certainly brought a lot of these things up in, in, in my classes before. And so, um, you know, it, it's never easy, uh, but somehow I've managed to uh, keep a, uh, uh, I guess, a, a sense of, of calmness when describing a lot of the, the, the history and ongoing practice um, regarding this work, but also thinking about one thing that I, I left out that helps to explain the significance of Crosland's books is that, and I just, I just read um, Shelby's comment, um, hi Shelby, um, you know, really nice to learn more about Cherokee culture and spirituality. You know, a lot of the times in our indigenous communities, we don't talk about this very openly. And so the significance of Crosland's books is, and really the work of the medicine keepers is to um, acknowledge this, but also to, to try and, 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 and responsibly get the word uh, out about our spiritual understandings and, and practices and and, and perspectives so that others might benefit from that knowledge um, in ways that, again, many indigenous communities uh, still don't feel comfortable with sharing due to a history of ridicule, of exploitation, of misuse. Uh, so it's important to acknowledge that uh, as well as, you know, again, highlight the significance of someone uh, wanting to, to write books um, that, that convey at least on a very general level some of these teachings for everyone to pick up and read and hopefully think about and incorporate in uh, our current times. I know that there's been a couple of hands raised, so I wanna... Michaela, looks like you're up first. Thank you, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That was, I mean, just so much to think about. Um, yeah, moving forward. One thing that, that really, stood out to me was the significance of words and language and and how you talked about words and I would really love to learn more about that relationship between language and healing and relationship um now is that something that is in the books that you've recommended is are there other places I should look yeah, I would say thank you for your question. Um, the, the the that connection is so important. Um, the one that I presented or that sh that I showed um, uh, on the last slide or on the the last of the the three book slides, um, Sounds of Tohi. So Tom Belt is a, a fluent speaker. He's also very much involved in, in language revitalization and linguistics work. Um, so they they really do a good job of unpacking some of these linguistic concepts, if you will, or, or Cherokee language concepts. 
Um, so I would recommend that you pick up that as well as there's a, a an article uh, that Tom Bell co-wrote with Heidi Altman called, I think just simply Tohi, or there, there's a subtitle there, but it's, it's more of a, a, a dedicated study on the word itself, Tohi. But yeah, you know, when we think about our languages and especially in the context of assimilation policies, historical assimilation policies and ongoing kind of um, pressures uh, from the dominant society, it's, it's, it's so important to, to center that, or to really kind of highlight the, the knowledge and perspectives that are contained within our language and that are so vitally important for understanding our connection to um, as I was discussing today, health, but the other than human world and most indigenous languages are, are very descriptive in nature. They're verb based. Um, linguists would call them polysynthetic. So um, you can't really, for Cherokee specifically, you can't, it's, it's very different, difficult to uh, separate uh, individual phonemes uh, within a, a word and, and come up with a, a meaning. Um, so what that means for our language is that it's, uh, as I said, descriptive. Um, it uh, conveys mostly action. So even the nouns in our language are typically conjugated verbs. Um, and so describing what a plant does, how it relates to its um, uh, environment, its ecology, how another animal uses that plant, um, how people use that plant, all of these things. Uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is the language itself is relational. And so the language itself conveys um, a non-human centric uh, understanding of the world, um, as well as, um, you know, as the story that I opened up with how to uh, think about the world in ways that uh, emphasize being in good relationship. So all of that um, hopefully was able to come through, but I think you, to your question, it's, it's absolutely important. Uh, and it, it's been heartening to see all the, the work that, um, who we might call language activists, you know, in, in indigenous communities, including the Cherokee community, uh, have been putting into revitalizing our languages. And that's uh, certainly a central part of the land education program that I spoke to at, at the very last part of the presentation, um, that, you know, the students are learning from the medicine keepers uh, names for these plants, as well as um, how to talk about what they're doing in the woods as a way to, you know, again, reconnect in that way and, and lead to better health uh, for them and for their community and family and for future generations. Thank you so much. Thank you. I did notice another hand up, although it did go away. So I just wanna pause and recognize that that person has a question. And if not, I just wanna note that John has a comment. Thank you. I hope you're in contact with some of the remaining indigenous peoples here in the heavily used front range foothills plains with intermixing. Mm -hmm. I think the other hand was mine, <laughs> but I just want to congratulate. Um, yes, Kate, thank you for all the information. And also like how, like like, like he was saying, like how similar are, can be our cultures, but also, like how afraid are we are to share in any kind of information because you'd never know. Like we see that all the knowledge that you bring, it can be taken and then you left behind, right? And that has been happening over and over. And, but also we acknowledge that is very important knowledge that needs to be shared with everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you for everything you did. Yes, thank you for that. Absolutely. And that, that's been a, a really amazing thing to, to see happen among the, the elders in the medicine keepers is, um, you know, throughout the course of our work together, you know, there, there's been a, an evolution, if you will, of, um, you know, their perspective on that. And um, if you want to, to hear from them directly, um, you can go to YouTube and type in Cherokee Voices for the Land. And that's a, uh, a short video it's about 30 minutes so if you've got 30 minutes and want to check it out i recommend it it's based on a photo voice project that we did uh, together and it is a still image documentary with uh, their voices so it's their voiceovers 
um, talking about photographs that they took themselves. And the idea was for them to go out, take pictures of plants, places, um, and other natural features, whatever they wanted to, to photograph that conveyed to them the meaning of the relationship between land and health. So I didn't wanna take up um, the limited time that I had today and trying to work with technology and the video, but I wanted to mention that um, as a way for you all to get to know them more. Uh, and again, you know, to your point, Adriana, um, you know, I, I asked them at the end of that project, is this something that you want to share um, on a platform like YouTube? And all of them in the room were nodding yes. And so it's an example yet again of, you know, coming to terms with, um, yes, the history of exploitation and ridicule, but also with the insistence that these this, this broad knowledge, not necessarily the specifics, um, but the broad knowledge is important to get out into the world. Has a lot to, to teach and, and has a lot of value, especially in our current context um, you know, with climate change and, and many other uh, issues that we face. Thank you, Adriana, for that question and comment. Please go ahead. No, just thank you. Thank you. Just want to note, looking at the chat, John says, this kind of deep understanding would be so valuable for understanding racism, sexism, and systemic denial of the causes of inequity here and now. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, John. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of intersections and, you know, you know, Croslin and in his books also writes about this in a way that is emphasizing the fundamental um, unity that I think um, we've lost sight of. Um, so he's, that's one of his overarching messages is when we look back to our traditional teachings um, and, you know, within Ketua traditions and understandings of um, how we relate to the rest of the world, it's always about acknowledging all people. Um, and so, I think that there's also commonalities with other indigenous traditions there as well. I was talking to a Hopi colleague and friend of mine um, and, you know, in, in Hopi traditions and, and, and spirituality, when they pray, they acknowledge everyone. It's not just uh, about Hopi people. Same with Cherokee, same with Ketua people. Uh, when we pray and acknowledge, uh, and even as Croslin writes in the, the practice of medicine, you're acknowledging everyone in those prayers. Um, so yeah, seemingly a simple but profound uh, advice for all of us today. Well, I wanna note that we've got about two minutes left, but there's a question from Hannah in the chat. She asks, how do the practices you discuss relate to veterinary practices with the healing medicine of animals? Hmm. I'm, I think I could go, go in a couple of different ways with that question. Um, you know, when we talk about the medicine of animals, that's an interesting point. Um, a lot of times people, when they think of traditional indigenous medicines, they think of, you know, plants. Um, and the medicine keepers have taught me that, you know, we, we can find medicine in animals as well. And I think that what Hannah's getting at is, kind of like the um, psychological healing. But um, if you watch that video that I mentioned, Cherokee Voices for the Land, uh, David Scott talks about, you know, medicine coming from animals as well as plants. Um, and so, you know, I won't get into any details, but I think it's important to acknowledge that when we talk about connection to land and connection to other than human beings, um, animals, figure prominently within that as well. And going back to the story that I opened up with, um, you know, animals form the basis of our traditional forms of governance. So uh, the clan system, thinking about, uh, well, not only was it centered on specific animals, um, but it was also matrilineal. And so it was, um, you know, women passed on the clan through their line. And so our society was constructed around a connection to the land and connection to animal relatives as well as the, the authority and centrality of, of women in, in, in making decisions and, and really determining 
um, uh, the course that our communities would would set um, in, in all different kinds of affairs. So I think that's also a profound lesson that we might learn from in today's day and age. Well, I want to be mindful of time. My goodness, this hour went by quickly. I first want to recognize our Arts and Sciences Jedi partners for sponsoring this and encourage everyone to take a look at the other Let's See You Well and Be Well content, as well as Jedi content. And I've also included a link to Clint's page here at CU Boulder to learn more about his outstanding work. And so in the interest of time, I want to thank everyone for coming, but most especially, thank you so much, Dr. Clint Carroll, for your passions, your expertise, and for sharing your knowledge with our community. Um, with that being said, we'll take just a moment to sign off, and I hope to see you at the next See Well event. Thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. Thank you all. Great to see all of you. Take care. Thanks, Erin. Thank you so much. All right. All right. I'll sign off for, for both of us. Okay, great. Take care. Bye-bye.